Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga readings episode. My name is Adam and today I'm going to read you a preview that was just dropped today, this morning, at least I think so, <laughs> of Dragons of Fate, book two in the Dragonlance Destinies uh, trilogy that comes out 1st of August this year. Pretty excited about it. And when Dragons of Deceit came out, there was three different updates that they provided, uh, like excerpts that they provided. This is the first of this novel, so I think they're probably going to give us two more in different publications like they did the first time last year. Again, so I'm really, really excited to dive into this before we all get an actual opportunity to dive into it. You know what I mean? Hey, Chris, thanks for tuning in, man. All right. So let's look at Polygon Magazine. Of course, we've all seen this image already. Dragonlance goes back in time with an excerpt from Dragons of Fate, a new novel. And the quote, this is sort of the, the hype pull quote here, subhead, is the second book is explosive. It's not the tame second act by any stretch of the imagination. It's explosive. We can riff on what we think that means afterward, but I kind of want to go through the... Oh, where is it? I want to go through the excerpt read that and then let's just have a little bit of fun and just sort of talk about it for a little bit this is my friday so i have nothing else to do today so let's <laughs> let's do this and let's have some fun doing it shall we <clears throat> all right you have to look at me when i do this i just don't like the idea of you staring at text while i'm reading it Raceland brought the words to a spell to mind one he had memorized centuries ago and took out a pinch of bat guano, a simple spell. As a novice mage, once again, he lacked the magical skill to cast anything else. And to think I had the power to challenge the gods, he thought with grim irony. They heard the sound of feet rustling through the forest undergrowth and a shrill voice singing. Your one true love's a sailing ship, the anchor's at our pier. We lift her sails, we man her decks, we scrub her portholes clear. Raceland let the words of the spell slide from his mind. Tassel off. I found Sturm, Taz announced when he saw them. He and Huma and some other men are coming to help the soldier. And look who came with me, Raceland. This is Magius. And see what he has with him? He has your staff. Magius came into view, walking slightly behind Taz. The mage was a typical Salamnic in appearance, with hair the color of the ripening wheat and blue eyes. He had high cheekbones, a determined jaw, a sardonic smile, and a mocking glint in his eyes. He wore red robes, since the war wizards were not permitted to wear the white robes that betokened peace, and a silver ring on his left hand. Eyeing the ring, Raceland wondered if it was magical. He knew from history that Magius was now in his thirties, and was his friend as was his friend Huma. That meant that Raceland was the younger of the two, with far less knowledge and experience at this time in his life. Magius walked slowly, leaning on his staff as though exhausted, which might be true, for he had been casting spells that fatigued the body and drained the mind. But Raceland was not fooled. He had used the same deception himself, leaning heavily on his staff to lull an enemy into complacency by feigning weakness. With one word of magic, Magius could turn that staff into a deadly weapon. Raceland could not fault the mage for taking precautions, for he was now encountering strangers who had been skulking about in the woods during the time of war. But as his gaze swept over the group, Raceland saw he appeared to be more intrigued than afraid. Sturm and Huma are bringing help for the soldiers who got hurt, Taz was saying. Magius wanted to come ahead to meet everyone. This is Destina Rosethorn. Destina did not look like a noble lady, for her clothes were covered with leaves and stained with blood, and her black hair had come unbound and tumbled down around her shoulders. But she shook out her skirt, brushed the, off the leaves, and greeted Magius with the poise she would have used to welcome a guest to her manor house. Thank you for coming to help us, sir, she said graciously. She gestured to Tully. This man was attacked by goblins and is wounded. Magius inclined his head in acknowledgment. My friend is bringing men from the village with a litter. 
His voice was confident, self-assured, taking command of the situation, wary but not fearful. His blue eyes flickered past Destina to fix on Raceland. And this is my wizard friend, Raceland Majir, Taz continued excitedly. I was telling Magus about you, Raceland, how, to, how you cough up blood and you have golden skin and hourglass eyes. Magius regarded Raceland with a cool, appraising look. Golden skin, pupils the shape of hourglasses, your hair prematurely white. The test, said Raceland by way of explanation. Magus' expression grew shadowed. He nodded in understanding and said nothing more. He, too, would have taken the test. And, like Raceland and all other mages, he would be loath to reveal what had happened to him. Raceland observed his fellow mage with interest and some reluctance. Homo was celebrated as a hero in story and song, but none of the heroic tales mentioned Magius, probably because Salamnix distrusted magic, and they chose to ignore that their hero had been friends with a wizard. But Raceland had heard stories of Magius all his life, for wizards honored him to this day and kept his memory alive. Yet Raceland knew the old adage that warned against meeting your heroes, for they can never measure up to your expectations and were certain to disappoint. He wondered if that would be the case with Magius, and held himself aloof. "'Greetings, brother,' said Magius. "'I have long thought that I was the only wizard in Salamnia. I am pleased, albeit astonished, to meet you.' Another. "'Raceland is the friend I was telling you about,' said Taz. "'The one who owns your staff.' And to think all this time I had been laboring under the misconception that I owned my staff, Magius said, his lips twitching in amusement. The Kender has your staff confused with an old walking staff of mine, Raceland said. I'm not confused, Taz said offended. I know it's the same staff, because your staff has a dragon claw holding a crystal ball on top just like this one. I can prove it. He turned to Magius. Does the crystal ball in your staff light up when you say shellac? Because Raceland's staff used to do that. Magius had been amused before, but he was not amused now. The magic word used to light the crystal of the staff was Shirak, not Shellac, but the two were close enough to raise questions. What else do you know about my staff, Master Burford? Magius spoke to the Kender, but he was watching Raceland. Call me Taz, said Taz. Everyone does. Raceland said it was the staff of Magius, and that it had been your staff. He was really proud of it and wouldn't let me touch it, even though I promised I wouldn't get it dirty. Although, I guess I should say the staff will be his, because, of course, it's your staff now. Magius raised an eyebrow at this puzzling statement. Raceland was still holding the bat guano, and he seriously considered using it to blast the kender. Fortunately for Taz, Sturm and Huma entered the woods at that moment, and Taz forgot the staff. <laughs> man. All right, that is it. I'm stoked. Oh my gosh, I'm excited. Okay, here's something that I noticed that sort of got me wondering what the what. Let me scroll to the top again. Um, and to think I had the power to challenge the gods, Raceland thought in grim irony. Now, this is Raceland in the red robes, right? Like, I'm trying to remember, certainly on the cover, it's Red Robes. But this is after the War of the Lands, which means it would have been Black Robes. But then, if he goes back in time to the Age of Might, it would have been before he was born at all, so it doesn't matter what color of robes he was or is or could be. He would still be the same person that he was when he traveled back in time. So he should be wearing Black Robes, not Red Robes. And why does he not have the power that he once knew he had? He knew he could challenge the gods, which tells me this is after Legends. But if this is after Legends, again, why is he wearing the red robes? Why can he not cast spells? Because the robes don't infer power. Your knowledge as a wizard and the power of the moons give you your authority. So he should, Raceland by all rights, be wearing black robes and have all of the power that he had when he left the present time, his present time to return to the Age of Might where he is right now. So that doesn't make any sense at all. And what drives me crazy about stuff like this is that if you're going to impose rules of time travel, well, you've already done that with Dragonlance Legends. And that didn't happen then. He was a black robe, traveled back in time, battled in one fist and Danalus, and challenged the gods in one, in one timeline. And then sort of 
reversed it when he realized how shitty life was going to be. So he still has all of that power. So why the hell can he not cast magic unless the authors are once again reneging on established lore, which they've done in the past, and it wouldn't be unheard of if they did it again, but it is frustrating as a reader. Consistency is important. Here's another thing that bothers me. Tasselhoff was convinced like an idiot that he was married to Destina as the Kender. So is that not a thing anymore? Is this so long into the book or so early into the book that since the Kender that Destina looked like is no longer around, Taz is no longer convinced that he's married? Like there's just these little things that they may make sense once the novel comes out. Fingers crossed that they do. But if they don't, that's a pretty big problem. Pretty doggone big. All right, so uh, super psyched about this. Me too, man. <laughs> this, Jason, thanks for joining live. This is an excerpt that just came out of Dragons of Fate, the book that's going to be released this August 1st, the second book in the Dragonlance Destinies uh, trilogy. Uh, this is not an audiobook. This is just me reading the excerpt that was published by Polygon. And you can actually see it right here. This is the Polygon article. And it's linked in the description below as well if you want to read it yourself. And you probably should because it's it's a nice little excerpt. All right, so let's see here. You still remember how Raceland loved that female potato dwarf? <laughs> the female potato dwarf. That's a funny <laughs> that's a funny reference to the gully dwarf Bapu. Um, let's see. You think that was the only compassion he ever gave to anyone? Well, not quite. He was always compassionate against victims of bullying and the sick he was he would always help the sick uh bapu was just because he cast charm on her and so he sort of he was endeared to her because she was so innocent and, and cute and she gave him fist of Daniels' spell book so how could he be mad at her you know he's gotta love her uh wooden gama how you doing why are the reprints of all the dragonlance books have a yellow border with no dragonlance logo at the top of the front covers so in this particular case that you're using the classics logo so that Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is not adhering to the novel trilogy of Dragonlance Destinies that Margaret Weiss and Trace Hickman are putting out, that they're now halfway through releasing. They don't want to be beholden to what they're going to change or what they're going to do, and so they made them put the classics nomenclature above the Dragonlance logo so that we know this has nothing to do with the gaming products that are going to be released or that have been released. So it's really just a signal to us, the readers and gamers. Uh, here's a mind bender. What is the reason Magius permitted the staff to end up in Raceland's friends all along because of this meeting? Yeah, I think you're reaching. <laughs> I think this is just that simple time travel thing where if an object, and this happened with Tasselhoff too, if Tasselhoff travels back in time to meet his friends when Raceland was wearing the red robes, and that's the Raceland that goes back in time to meet Magius, he had the Staff of Magius. But because you can't have two items in one place, just like you can't have two Tasseloffs in one place, one of them disappears and is replaced with the original in this timeline. What's interesting is that the Tasselhoff wasn't replaced. It was the, so objects apparently get replaced, but not people. So for example, the Tasselhoff of the time at the in the last home that they went back to, he was replaced by the stupid Tasselhoff that thought he was married, and then they went back further in time when they tried to go forward in time, right? Um, and the time travel device broke from Dragonlance, or Dragons of Deceit book. So, I mean, it's been like a year since I read it, so I'm sort of thinking of it and remembering it as I'm talking. And so, the modern Tasselhoff replaced the old Tasselhoff. The Staff of Magius must have gone back to its previous owner rather than allowing Raceland to hold on to it. And so, again, this is where consistency with time travel laws is important. They can be whatever you want. Just make sure they're consistent. If something gets replaced, then it has to be the same for everything. You know, not just one thing. Because then we as an audience have a hard time following your illogical excuse that's how i see it uh the moons you love how they are the three moons that represent the three alignments yeah that's so i uh they went back in time the first meeting at the end of the last home of the very first book raceland should have no idea he ever challenged the gods because he hasn't done it yet yeah that's the the thing that's the that's what drives me nuts like 
if he already knows, that means it's the Raceland from after Legends. So this is a huge inconsistency. And I'm hoping they explain it because it, just in this one synopsis, it's not the first inconsistency. The second being the Staff of Magius and uh, Destina and Tazalok. So let's see. Um, you need to see what order to read the books and then go from go re and then go read them. Okay, so well the for this trilogy, the first book you should read is the Dragonlance Chronicles, starting with Dragons of Autumn Twilight. Go through the Chronicles, and then you can pick this book, Dragons of Deceit, up, which is the first of this trilogy, and you'll logically understand what's happening. If you really want to get into it, there's a whole bunch of other books you can read, but you don't need to. Arguably, you don't even really need to read the Chronicles. If you just want to dive into the Dragonlance Destinies trilogy, then Dragons of Deceit, and that's really it. They do a pretty good job of, of uh, explaining things in that book, I think, if memory serves. Don't mean to jump the gun if you were going to discuss the later, sorry, the latter, but the rest of the interview had disappointing news about Watsi and the d, &D channel coming to Paramount. So I didn't see any other article after the synopsis. I saw a headline that said that they were hopeful about a series, but again, that doesn't mean anything. And I've been saying the whole time, just because a project is in development, Joe Maganello is developing a Dragonlance series, and he was originally developing a Dragonlance film that never got off the ground. So why do we think the series is going to get off the ground? Because YouTubers wanted to get a bunch of attention on their channel. That's why. It's... I understand people get excited about it, but I don't see it happening. I really don't. I want it to happen desperately, but there's just no reason why I, I, I can think that it would. So let's see. This is probably an early draft and not the book. This is definitely an excerpt from the novel. Like, this is what they release. Now, that doesn't mean it's not changed in any way, because they did that with the last three excerpts of the first book. They did change some information so as not to leak surprises that would then uncover in the actual novel reading. So they may have changed some stuff in this to make it fit so that either it draws more hype or it doesn't spoil any secrets. And so, you know, we do have to take these excerpts with a little bit of grain of salt, but you should have salt, a little grain of salt with everything, right? Let's see. You hope that they are completely retcon of the Age of Might. That's an... Oh, Age of Morals. I see what you're saying. I actually think it's going to be a retcon of the Age of Might. <laughs> I think you were right the first comment. Jay, thanks for tuning in live, by the way. So, um, I have said this over and over again. I'll say it one more time. Margot Weiss and Tracy Hickman, specifically Tracy Hickman, created Huma, Dragonbane, and Magius. Like, it's their babies. Richard Knack went off to write The Legend of Huma, which reneged a whole bunch of the little story synopsises that were dropped um, throughout the poems and the the books and stuff, or the, the modules and stuff, about Huma and Magius. So the Legend of Huma novel is not consistent with what Huma Dragonbane was when Tracy Hickman originally created him. I think because they do specifically say they're wrestling with this idea of heroes and the realities of the heroes and how they're adding context and character to characters like Huma and Magius, I think they're going to dramatically change those characters from how they were presented in The Legend of Huma. And it's going to piss off a bunch of people that loved that novel. And I can understand, but again, I would say this is Tracy Hickman's baby. This is not Richard Knack's baby. So if you want to fall in love with a version of a character, definitely go with the creators, not the people who came in after the fact. Same thing with James Lauder and Lord Soth. I love the Lord Soth novels. That went in uh, 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 um, Ravenloft. But Tracy Hickman's the one that created Lord Soth. That Lord Soth, the Ravenloft Lord Soth, is a different Lord Soth. The Tracy Hickman Lord Soth is not different. It's just different from James Louder, James Louder's Lord Soth. So we have to always remember that other authors come in, write these characters differently, and the original authors are going to ignore that because that's not how they envisioned them. I think it's going to piss off a bunch of people. I do not see this retconning the Age of Mortals, and I hope no one gets their hopes up. I really do, because it, I don't think it's going to happen. So you looked it up, Amber of Ashes series, War of Souls. So the War of Souls series is in the Age of Mortals. It's 
right before the Amber and Ashes was actually the Dark Disciple trilogy, not the Dragonlance Destinies trilogy, and that's different. So that's the Amber and Ashes was part of the Dark Disciple trilogy, which is only Margaret Weiss, not Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, and that is the latest, the last uh, series that the original writers ever wrote, or half of them anyway. Let's see. Weiss and Hickman also mentioned that Watsy didn't consult them on Shadow of the Dragon Queen. Of course they didn't, but their tone, that's why they have the classics nomenclature right here. Um, oh, where did it go? But the tone sounded contentious, which doesn't bode well for characters of future chances of future collaboration. I don't think we're getting anything else. Full stop. Once this trilogy is done, they sued Watsy in order to put this trilogy out. They won the lawsuit. So Watsy's going to let them put it out, and then they're not going to do anything else with them ever again, I think. Because imagine that relationship, right? You have people that just sued you in order to let them publish their book under your IP. Why would you ever work with them again? They're litigious. They literally sued you. I wouldn't if I was Watsy. Of course, as a fan, I want them to. But as like a business reality from a corporate sensibility standpoint? No. They're going to make them put that nomenclature of classics. They're going to put out those three books like they said they would in court. And then they're going to just wipe their hands clean and never go back to Dragonlance again. That's my guess. Let's see. Um, Weiss is part of the Facebook group and you asked her today if they're finishing with the final book. And she said, yes, it was just at the editing stage. Hopefully it's even better than the first book. I agree. Did she drop a hint about what the name is? The title? So the Knack book should have been a trilogy. You just read that. Uh, it really gave no time for Magius and Huma to have adventures together. That being said, Kaz is 100% Knack's baby. Oh, yeah, definitely. 100%. All of Dragonlance Minotaurs are Knack's baby. Like, he completely defined everything about them. Uh, you're pretty sure you read both story series of books. Oh, that's cool. All right. So I'm excited for this book. It's going to be out August 1st. It looks like it's going to be a very interesting read. Uh, the person that's helping them with sort of all the lore, which apparently, according to this, he is wrong. <laughs> but, you know, let's hope, fingers crossed, that it's just a mistake or it's an intentional misdirect. Um, but that guy said that he cried when he read it because he read the advanced copy of it. So hopefully that means it's good and not just pure nostalgia. I like nostalgia, but I want something new with it. That's why I like Dragon's, Lances, uh, uh, Dragons of Deceit because Destina Rosethorn, her mom, her, her uh, well, husband at one time, was it husband, it was her uncle. Um, all of that whole lore on that side was really, really interesting like when they interacted with the existing characters and stuff, I thought it was not very good. But when they interacted with new characters, I thought it felt pure Dragonlance and it felt great. Um, and so I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that this is going to be good because I want it to be good. I love Dragonlance, obviously, just like all of you. So let, let's just hope. And it's very interesting because ultimately Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman have no say about the Dragonlance IP at all. They don't own it. TSR owns it. TSR sold it to Watsy. Watsy sold to Hasbro. So Hasbro owns Dragonlance. Not Margaret and Tracy Hickman. Uh, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. So we always have to remember that. As much as we think that those authors are like the shape changers and movers and direction and stuff, they really have no say. They're only reliant on the IP holder to ask them to contribute to it. And they just sued them. So I don't think that's happening again. I think, I think we're going to get this trilogy and Dragonlance will go off into the sunset. And that's just, that's how it works. That's how IP works. I really like the Dwarven scenes in the first book as well. I do too. I just felt it was really rushed and short. I would have liked her to go into Thorbard and take more time there. And then, you know, the, the way they presented the avatar uh, Dugan Redhammer of Reorks, I didn't like. I just, I don't know. They, you know, they, there are aspects of that first book that really fall flat. Tasselhoff being the biggest one for me, personally. But there's also aspects that really got me excited. 
So it, it's a mixed bag. And that's arguably, that's the best you can do. If I wanted to be happy about it, I would just write it myself and then it would just be my story. You know what I mean? So we, we're really relying on what the creators, the direction they want to go in and how they want to treat the characters that they created. And you just have to accept it or move on. Those are your only choices. So what are you going to do? All right. Um, they didn't mention the third book's name. For the money is Dragons of Up Yours, <laughs> Watsy. <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah, I love the Minotaur culture, man. I got a bunch of videos on that in this channel. Genuinely hopeful for this, but it'd be nice if they incorporated some of Nax's character, characterization of Huma. I doubt it. I think, I mean, they, let me find the quote. So Hickman says, I think we all have visions of our heroes. We have a tendency to carve them in marble and make them perfect icons in our mind. And I think that for us, having an opportunity to view Huma, to view Magius as people, as flawed individuals, and to get past the marble statues with them has been part of the journey of this book itself. That tells me this is not going to be the Magius and Huma that you know from that book. It's just not. So... <laughs> Just gotta deal with it, man. You can make a really good Dragonlance book. You know the lore better than anyone. That's not true. <laughs> I appreciate the confidence, but no, that's definitely not true. I only know what I've read. <laughs> Everything else I'm completely black on. I have no idea. Uh, you hated the whole quest in the first book. Fell down purch uh, purchasing the gray gem. Pretty anticlimactic. Yeah, that whole aspect. It happened so quickly that it, it didn't feel like there was genuine stakes at all. You know, it was just like, oh, this is the next step in our adventure, so let's hurry up and do this side quest, and then we can continue on, and man, it just fell flat for me anyway. Clearly, I'm not the only one. All right, so this story will spoil major plot points for Dragons of Deceit, the first book. Yeah, so yeah, if, if any of you haven't read Dragons of Deceit, I have spoiled a lot of it for you just in talking about it. So, sorry. <laughs> Oops. I don't know. I don't know what to do. All right, I've got a members reading up next. That's all that I had for this. I just wanted to sort of riff a little bit with you guys and have a little bit of fun, you know. I mean, this stuff is good. I, I love this stuff so much. Thank you all for tuning in to this Dragonlance Saga reading. What did you think of the preview? Are you excited to hear more about Magius and Huma? Feel free to email me at info at or leave a comment below. This channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga, and thank you for joining in that celebration. Again, my name's Adam with Dragonlance Saga, and until next time, Slanjavar.